Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Can you guys hear me? Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Too slow for you guys. See my slide? Avinash, yeah, can you see my slide, you. Avinash? Yes, doctor. Uh, can you see my slide? Yeah, I can, I can. Advantages okay. of biotechnology. Because I cannot see my own slide. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so <laughs> um, good afternoon everyone. Um, first off, I would like to apologize because uh, for one thing, I cannot open my camera. Um, and second thing, there might be like very, very laggy slides. Um, this is because at exactly 11.58 a.m. just now, bangunan uh, makmal kimia internet suddenly went off. So I was preparing everything and suddenly got disconnected. Um, now I'm trying to I need to connect everything to my mobile and as you guys I have also noticed um, the mobile broadband in Bangna Mawal Kimia is very very weak so the internet will be very very limited um, so uh, but anyhow I'm recording this I hope <laughs> that everything will go smoothly um, but otherwise uh, I need to try and record it on my desktop as well just bear with me for a while um, because otherwise there won't be any recording for today uh, especially if the network is very very laggy let me see um sorry i'm trying to set i'm trying to set so that um I can record everything even though my internet is very slow. Hold on. Um, two. That one. Oh. oh. I can just record my iPad. That's true. Oh, I cannot record because I'm doing a sharing from my iPad. Okay, um, anyhow, we'll just try our best. Um, so you guys need to focus because there might not be any recording. <laughs> okay, all right. So um, last week we stopped here, uh, advantages of biotechnology and chemistry. Um, I don't want, probably I don't have to go to the previous slides. Okay, so I'll just carry on from here and uh, moving on to the next topic after this, okay? So we've looked at um, some advantages of biotechnology and chemistry uh, to be more specific in the selectivity of biomaterials. Um, we talk a little bit very, very quickly on, on um, how biotechnology is in comparison to a pure synthesis, okay, which uh, the keyword is it's greener. And then the last one we've looked at just a very tiny bit on um, what we can use uh, cell Okay, as a chemical factory. Okay, so these are some of the advantages of biotechnology. Of course, you will see in, in a bit more detail as we go on. Um, so this one is kind of like, you know, an entree for the um, whole course. Okay, so some hindrances of biotechnology in chemistry. Um, so if you actually work in this field, uh, say one day if you want to work in this field, something that uh, a pure chemist or, or people who actually do um, pure synthesis would normally comment it on uh, these three features. So they are the main issues in using biotechnology in, if you were to do um, any synthesis using biotechnology um, platform. Okay? The first one is the bioreaction. Uh, what it means is um, because it's biology, okay, so when we are talking about biology, um, especially in this course, we are talking about cells and of course about enzymes. Okay, and these two things, because it's bio or living things, there is always a limitation in the sense that, um, say for example, if you're doing a pure synthesis, uh, pure chemical synthesis, you can work um, at a pH of say one, or even 14, and the reaction might still work. However, because you are using a living thing, there are a certain limitation in terms of the pH that you need to use. Um, 
So limits in terms of pH, okay, based on temperature, and perhaps because this one, um, if you are using cells, for example, you need to have oops, you need to have a specific media. So there are a lot of things that you need to consider, and all of these things will need to be under a thermodynamically equilibrium. Okay, so because um, so say for example, for a living cells. They need to have a media. So the media normally contains um, glucose or some other amino acids that are essential for the living cells. So as the reaction passes, so originally if you are thinking about the concentration of um, your media, originally you, where you will have 100%, as time passes, so the media will go low and low. Okay, so you need to, to make sure that the reaction is in thermodynamic equilibrium. So when you have a system um, in, say, uh, if you have a bacteria that are doing some reaction in a flask, you always need to have something that can input new media and something that can extract the old media. Okay, so you need to make sure that these things are under equilibrium. Okay, so these are the things, well, if you want to consider this, um, if you were to compare between uh, a pure chemistry and a biotechnology, then yes, these are kind of like an disadvantage of using a biotechnology, but we will see next, um, the next coming slide, that these things, even though one might say it's a disadvantage, but if you think about a dynamic system, if you can create a dynamic biotechnology uh, system, so these things can be um, like, uh, um, you know, you, you can solve it very easily, okay? Now, second one. So if you were to use cells and enzymes, there's a lot of tuning that needs to take place. What do I mean by tuning is, again, um, so when you're talking about erection, you need to have a specific pH. So when you are talking about biological tuning, what it does it, it needs to be fine-tuned to get a different outcome. So say for example, if you are using um, a cell, uh, a bacteria called E. coli, okay, so this is a very um, general bacteria, uh, Escherichia coli is a very um, commonly used bacteria in a biotechnological field, okay? So this bacteria, even though it's the same bacteria, and say for example, if you want to do A plus B equals to C, Okay, and then you manage to optimize it. It, will, it was very successful. You get a very high yield. But if, say, you are using the same bacteria to get B reacted with D to produce C, okay, you need to fine tune it again. You need to redo the whole process. So it can either be stimulation of targeted metabolism. So you might change the media, the pH or temperature so that um, the cell works in a different way. So you want to have a specific target of metabolism. Metabolism meaning a specific um, pathway, a chemical pathway, so to say. Okay. So if you want to do this and that simultaneously, okay. so you might say this one works at pH equals to 4, then you get E plus B equals to C, but then you can also change it to pH equals to, say, um, 8, so slightly more, one is uh, more acidic, one is more basic, and then you get this reaction on, um, to uh, go smooth, okay? So um, you need to do fine tuning. And then of course, suppression of biological roots. When you do a fine tuning, if you change the pH to four, for example, and what if E. coli does not survive at pH four? Therefore, this reaction will no longer work. Okay. So there are a lot of things that, that you need to play around, that you need to um, optimize or tune so that you can get the results that you want. However, once the, the advantage of fine tuning is that once um, it is fixed, meaning that you are def it, it's a definite go, if say the pH is 4, you have this type of media, temperature is 25, then you can replicate it anywhere in the world. Simply just take it out, put it in a different system, in a different laboratory, use the same um, uh, setup, then you can, you can get exactly the same thing. However, if you are thinking about chemical um, reaction, so to say, 
Okay, it depends on the lab. So say for example, um, in lab number one, where you need to do a heat uh, temperature, um, probably not heat up. Uh, you 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 want to cool down um, at a certain temperature to say minus ten degrees Celsius for a reaction to work. Okay, when you move to a different lab and you want to replicate the same reaction, um, so you want to reduce the temperature to minus ten degrees Celsius again. But imagine if the lab doesn't have the the uh, apparatus that is required to lower the temperature. Now you cannot replicate the whole reaction um, again. But for um, the fine tuning, okay, if you have a pH, especially if the reaction pH is about seven, you can simply use distilled water, um, temperature, as long as if it's around 25, then room temperature is okay. So regardless of where you are, um, even if you go to a snowy place, um, indoor temperature normally still maintains roughly about 20-ish um, degrees Celsius. So, you can still do your reaction, okay? But of course, uh, if you're doing a cell work, then even cell work doesn't go down into minus 10 degrees and it still works, okay? And the third hindrance in um, biotechnological field, if you are planning to do chemistry, is the um, isolation and separation, okay? What it means is that um, because you are producing uh, a molecule, so the molecule can be uh, produce inside of the cell instead of externally. So there are a lot of things that you need to consider and this can be um, of hindrance. So there's a lot of optimization that you need to do. But once it is optimized, the yield can be very, very high. The yield can be even purer and um, um, separation or, or purification might not be needed at all. Okay, so that's those are some advantages. So um, and now if you're still thinking about Okay, due to the advantages of using biotechnology, so which one should you use? Should you use the in vitro approach or in vivo approach? So in vitro approach is more on a petri dish. Okay, uh, in, in vivo is in organism. So normally when you're talking about in vivo and uh, in vitro, so in vivo normally when you talk about in animals, Okay, but in, in, in our case, um, it can be animal, it can be a living organism, and in vitro is more focused on using enzymes, okay, which is outside of the cell. Okay, so this, this, this are my definition um, related to biotechnology in vitro and in vivo. So animals or cells, okay, so inside. But if, you're, if you do read journal articles and so on and so forth, so the definition can be um, totally different, okay? So just make sure this is the definition, uh, particularly for this subject only, for a different subject that you need to relearn about what is in vitro, what is in vivo, what are the categories. Now, if you're looking at this isolated enzyme, which by my definition is in vitro and whole cell system, by my definition for this course is in vivo, okay? You can see the pros and the cons um, very, very easily there. So for example, for um, isolated enzymes, it can be in any form. So the pros is, is very simple. The cons is cofactor recycling necessary, limited enzyme stability and so on and so forth. So again, it goes back into fine tuning your reaction. Okay. Um, and you, know, you can just read one by one. Um, it's self-explanatory, um, I would say. Okay. Um, for uh, enzymes, of course, you can get high enzymatic activities after your fine tuning, uh, easy to perform, easy to replicate, easy workup, um, enzyme recovery easy. So uh, there are instances whereby you can actually um, kind of like um, link an enzyme to a solid support. So imagine that this is a solid support. What you can do is you can do a chemical reaction to um, actually link uh sorry guys someone is trying to call me i want to see who's trying to call me i have no idea who you are okay let's continue um so what you can do is you can have a solid support you can have a solid support like this and then you you can actually put your enzyme at the very end of the solid support okay so um i cannot change color but let me just draw it bigger so if imagine that that one is a solid support okay what do I mean by solid support is normally um, it's um, 
a resin. So you guys have worked with resin. Oh, you guys have not worked with resin uh, because you guys are at home. Okay, so um, in your second year experiment uh, analysis, there is an experiment whereby you are actually using embolis resin, uh, embolite resin, sorry, embolite resin um, to, what was it, to purify, um, to do an ion exchange reaction. Okay, so it's the same um, concept. Uh, you are using a resin or, or solid support. In this case, we normally call it as solid support. And then what you can do is you can attach your enzyme at the end of this solid support. And then what you do next is if you have a reaction in a, a filter funnel, for example, whereby you have a stop cock over there. Sorry, my ugly drawing. So you can have your solid support inside here. So what you can, you can do is you can add all the reagents necessary into the solid support, get the reaction to work, and then finally you can just drain the solution and take your product while leaving your um, enzymes and everything else still inside the reaction vessel. And what you can do here is you can recycle it and use it for a different batch of reaction. Okay, So that's one of the um, advantage. What and what it means by uh, enzyme recovery is it under immobilization. Okay. However, if you look at the advantages of using a whole cell is you don't need a cofactor. Okay. Meaning that um, an enzyme, if it's in a cell, normally is self-sufficient because the cell itself producing what it needs. Okay. You, you do need to have... Um, uh, external media, uh, food supply, energy supply, glucose, amino acids, and so on um, as the basic monomer for the cell to live. But other than that, um, you don't need to really regulate every single reaction inside um, the cell. Okay. So, but the cons is the, the equipment is expensive. Um, to you use a bioreactor, it is very expensive. Um, I think in the Last week, I've already showed you guys the picture. Uh, I think I, I've already put a picture of a bioreactor. Okay. Um, a tedious workout process due to large volume, low productivity due to lower concentration of tolerance, so on and so forth. So, but again, this one can easily be optimized. No uh, that big issue except for uh, expensive. Okay. So, growing culture, um, it has a high activity compared to an enzyme because, again, uh, enzymes are stagnant. If you use uh, one molar of enzyme, then forever it will stay as one molar. However, if you use a whole cell, of course, cell grow, and then cell can divide, so you can have a high activity provided that the cell keeps on division, okay? But the cons is, um, towards the end of the day, you'll get a large biomass, and uh, meaning that the cell will keep on growing and growing and growing. At one point, you will get like a very, very huge amount of cells, so you need to do something with it, okay? Um, you can have enhanced metabolism. You might have uh, byproducts because now the reaction itself might not be catered to only one type of reaction. There might be a few reactions going on, okay? And process control is a bit difficult, okay? But again, if you manage to do it, if you manage to fine tune it to whatever you want, then it's actually the very, very best. It's a very good system. Okay, resting cells, um, work out easier, reduce metabolism, fewer byproducts. So for resting cells, meaning that um, the cells are not dividing. So um, I did not go into very detail about cells um, systems because it's a bit complicated. Um, and um, because I don't think you guys, since you guys are chemistry background students, um, do not really know about cell growth and so on and so forth. So a lot of factors that plays a key important role. Okay, so for resting cells, if you were to use resting cells to um, get your chemical reaction going, you definitely will get a lower activity compared to an active cell. Okay, uh, and finally, immobilized cells, cell reuse is possible. Again, it's possible, um, but it's lower activity because you are limiting the cells to a certain um, solid support and so on and so forth. But normally, this is not an option that uh, anyone uses.
see the internet is a bit laggy yeah it should be an x not the tick okay all right so i think that is all for the introduction um, from last week so these are some resources that you can use to um, um if you would like to dig a little bit more of information you can you can find these uh, textbooks um either purchase it or try and find it online but i'm not encouraging you guys to download it um yeah it's illegal okay um now i have my online tutorial however because the internet is very very slow this one will not load okay so what i want you guys to do is um just simply go to this link as usual or if you have your poll f app you can open it and i will start the question okay so do it very very quickly in one minute um yep in one minute just try and solve this one so pull everywhere.com or pull f.com forward slash um zero four nine okay so the question is biotechnology is using natural resources as reagent for a chemical application is it true or false i'm not sure how many responses i have now but uh for now i have i have 100 percent over here okay now it changes now 86 and 14 point 13 17 15 <laughs> i would like to do a, a live event unfortunately um, as you can see from this slide it's space loading forever most likely because the internet is low okay 93 on the left hand side seven percent on the right hand side i'm not sure how many have answered how many do we have here we have about 18 Okay, semua orang dah jawab. Okay, dah. Dah. Okay, so the final answer, uh, what, this is not my answer, of course. This is your answers. 93% true and 7% false. Okay, drum roll. That one is the correct one. Okay. Um, Biotechnology is using natural resources as a region for chemical application um well it's true in one way however one critical um info is that the reagent itself doesn't need to be natural okay so it can be something else so it can be from a synthetic resources and then you put it in into a cell or you put it as a media for a cell and then the cell can still use it so it doesn't have to be a natural resources okay um it will still work that's one thing. The second thing, um, I, I didn't uh, write the question properly, uh, but biotechnology, by definition, is um, a, about process. Okay? And it's not about reagent or resources. So, um, I would say the answer is more towards the 7% over here. Okay? So, um, of course, in your final exam, it won't be as simple as this, true or false question. Um, I don't think we are allowed to do that. Uh, but um, yeah, this is just a practice. Okay. Um, something like this can come in the quiz, but not in your final exam. And uh, oh, by the way, uh, might as well I'll just tell you guys now. Um, your final exam so far. So I think last week I mentioned that I want to do a final exam. Okay. But um, most recent news that I received last Thursday is that um, all final exams, if we were to do a final exam, must be done through Spectrum, which I am a bit inclined to do that because you know Spectrum has a lot of issues. So um, we, me and and um, Prof Halijah might change instead of doing a final exam, we might do an alternative exam. Okay, so either you um, write an assignment or something like that. Okay, so, um, but since the news is very, very new, um, we still need to kind of like plan it a little bit. Uh, and therefore, I cannot give a definite answer whether you will have a final exam or you will have an alternative exam. Okay. Um, 
All right. So second question. Activating it. Okay. So what is a process of using enzymes extracted from a microbial or cell, um, a cell for uh, a biochemical application? For, let me see it there. Okay. All right. So, 3814. Okay. So, the options are fermentation, genetic technology, enzymatic technology, all of the above, or none of the above. So, anyone else wants to do it? I'll give you guys 30 more seconds. So fermentation is a process of using enzymes extracted from a microbial or cell for a chemical application. Or genetic technology is a process of using enzyme extracted from a microbial. Or enzymatic technology is a process of um, enzyme extraction or all of the above. Hopefully nobody sees that. Okay, so the correct answer is Yes. Okay. Now we have something like that. Okay. Thirty seven percent over there, seven percent there, forty seven percent there, and twenty percent over here. And that one is the correct one. Okay, enzymatic technology. So um if you go back to if I can just quickly scroll back. Okay, so it's about this line. So you have fermentation, genetic technology, and enzymatic technology. So fermentation and genetic technology, you are still using um, the living organism. Okay, enzymatic technology is the one that where you use um, extracted enzyme. So I put it there. You extract the enzyme, you put it in here, you have substrate, you put it in, take it out, you get your product. Okay, but everything else. Um, from the substrate, it goes into the cell and moving out. And the technology, basically, you manipulate your DNA over here to produce the product of interest. Okay, so you are producing, you are playing with genetics to get your product. In comparison to fermentation, you have a substrate from outside, um, and then you expose it to your cell, and then your cells will convert it to your product. Okay, so those are the. Hopefully, you guys can understand this. This uh, the differences. You get all of this. If you don't, do let me know. Okay, we have our WhatsApp group. We have Spectrum. There are many places where you can um, ask me. All right, and the last question is this. Activate the question. Where do enzymes increase? Then you should be able to. Uh, so for this question, what you need to do is you need to click on the location by which enzymes are being produced. So where is it being produced? Is it here or is it there? Just click on the location you think that it is being produced. Okay, we are getting more answers now. Alright, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 15. Okay, that's it. Anyone else? 14. 4 more? 15. 3 more? 2 more? 1 more? Oh, probably because the other one. Um, I think Nisa went out, right? Or is Nisa back? Or Nisa is back? Okay, alright. So, um, So these are your answers. So you get majority of, uh, not majority, I think about a quarter, or close to a quarter of you uh, choose this location. If you choose it on that area, 
for me. And it is more answers. <laughs> so a few chooses this area over here, a few chooses um, the yellow area. I don't know. Um, probably that one is a miss, uh, miss click. Okay. Um, but the correct answer for this one is the few. Okay. So uh, to see where it is produced exactly. So originally the synthesis protein synthesis part and the yellow bit over here. Okay, the yellow bit, and then it moves to this um, high end color, which is the Golgi apparatus. And this is what we call as Golgi apparatus to do a post modification. Okay, before it's being released either in the cytoplasm or it's being transferred out from the cell. Okay, so um, if you if a portion like this comes out then definitely the yellow and the cyan color um, are the correct answers. Okay? Uh, it won't be just this one or that one. Um, however, if you choose this, the nucleus, then it is wrong because um, the nucleus does not produce an enzyme. It produces the, um, the uh, mRNA that is needed before enzyme translation, okay? before you get the enzyme at all. Um, then the information comes from the middle bit over here. Okay? Then it's transferred into the yellow one, which we call as endoplasmic reticulum or ER. Okay? From the previous slide, um, this one is the ER, endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, this is where um, you have a lot of ribosomes that produces protein. Okay? It will translate the mRNA uh, into protein. Okay, so the correct answer is either here or here. Okay, um, if there's an option for your um, cytoplasm, then I will still accept it. Right, so this is the nucleus whereby DNA information is being converted into mRNA. And then mRNA we convert it into enzymes or protein. Okay, um, this is the endoplasmic reticulum where it contains a high number of um, ribosomes. Okay, and ribosomes convert um, this mRNA into protein. It's being done by ribosomes. Okay, and then this one is the Golgi. Where it does um, post translational modification. Okay, so post translational modification, what it means is that um, there are some enzymes, for example, uh, a protease. Okay, so you might have heard about this. Protease enzyme, so it functions to break down protein. Okay, so you might not want to release protease in a high quantity inside of the cell because otherwise it will degrade everything. Because um, cells contain a lot of proteins, so uh, proteases are normally being excreted out or being transported out of the cell before it's being used. Okay, so bulky apparatus, what it does is it, um, when um, at the ER stage, the protein enzymes are not active, okay, and when it reaches Golgi apparatus, Golgi apparatus modifies it a little bit so that it is ready to be uh, activated or to be activated, and then once it is being transported outside of the cell, there could be uh, an enzyme outside of this, um, outside of the cell, or on the bilayer of the cell that actually um, activates the protein. So those are the, the normal flow of uh, protein or enzyme synthesis. It goes from the nucleus, goes um, into the ER, and then uh, Golgi, and then from Golgi, either being released to the cytoplasm or being transported out of the cell. Okay. All right. So basically, um, we've covered the topic uh, very very briefly on what biotechnology. Just um, a brief on um, the um, criteria, the separation of the technology itself, 
Uh, but of course, we did not cover every single thing because it was the other day. This course is to capture the information about how to use methodology for Panic 3 um, applications. Okay? So, uh, but otherwise, the biotechnology concept is very, very huge, um, and we cannot simply finish the uh, introduction of biotechnology in just one lecture. Okay? So, moving on, we will look at um, enzymes or in vitro technologies. Um, first, and then once we cover all these four subtopics, then we move to our uh, individual technologies or cellular technologies. Okay? So for today, we'll just look at um, classification and selectivity in about 10 minutes. And of course, um, we definitely cannot finish by today, and we'll continue in next week. Okay? So uh, 2.1 classification of an enzyme and selectivity. So how does it work? When we're talking about selectivity, how does the enzyme work? So um, you probably have looked at the image of an enzyme, for example, the one on the left over here. Okay? So this is called as phos reddish peroxidase, or HRP, C1A. So this is a specific um, molecule, and um, you can actually view this image on your own if you go to protein data bank or pdb.org, and then you key in this keyword, one H. Then you will get this molecule. Okay, so um, the same molecule. So uh, HRP functions to oxidize the substrate using hydrogen peroxide or organic peroxide. And um, as um, a chemist or a biochemist or biotechnologist, HRP is one of the uh, widely used enzymes for various purposes. Okay, um, in my line of work, uh, for example, we use HRP to um, identify whether uh, we, of course, we don't just simply use HRP, so we use an antibody um, connected to HRP, okay. and then if, say, the antibody binds to a specific target, so when you do your reaction, um, the presence of the antibody contributed to HRP, uh, when you put the substrate, the substrate will be oxidized, producing a chromophore. So that is one example of how um, the importance of knowing about biotechnology. Yes, you can do for chemistry if you know if you want to know whether your reaction works or not. You can simply do uh, SPMS or you can do NMR spectroscopy. But sometimes, um, if say in my line of uh, research, what I'm producing is more of a drug for medical purposes. So um, you don't want to destroy one field altogether. Sometimes you want to just check whether um, the anti anti antibiotic works, or it doesn't work, or if you want to produce a vaccine, you want to know whether the vaccine works or not. Um, because if you just um, say purify a COVID nineteen antibody and then you inject it into HPLC, you will not know whether it works or not. You know that whether um, there is uh, an, an antibody or, or not, but you have no idea whether the antibody actually works. So one way to actually know whether it works or not is by um, analyzing it in kind of like a, a more biological environment. So um, antibody conjugated to HRP is one of the widely used options in um, analyzing whether something is there or not. Okay. All right. Um, I will show you guys an example on how to use uh, PDB ID um, next week. Um, I think I've already put a link in Spectrum. Okay, if you want to have a go, uh, have a look at it, then be my guest. You can actually open Spectrum and then click on uh, lecture notes. I have over there enzyme database, uh, expertise, and protein data bank structure analysis. Okay, so previously. Um, these are the methods that I've used um, for your senior alternative assessment. Okay. Um, so like that, I wasn't planning to use it, but um, since the most current information that I received is to use either spectrum or alternative assessment, so I'm inclined to use more alternative assessment because I hate spectrum. Okay. It, it doesn't work. 
as what you intended it to do. Okay, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, so what is an enzyme? Uh, enzyme is a machinery of life, it's what makes you you, it makes you function. Without enzyme, then pretty much you are dead, or, or yeah, well, even a virus which are defined as a non living organism has enzyme. So each enzyme has a specific duty or non specific duty for a bodily function. So in case of our human, uh, we do have a specific or non specific. Non specific meaning, what does it mean? Is that um, protease, for example, is one example. Okay. So I mentioned in the previous slide that it breaks down uh, proteins, right? So which type of protein that, that it actually breaks down? Uh, so it's not a specific. Okay? So meaning that if you have a protein, um, you have any, um, you have hundred of enzymes. So chances is it will degrade um, eighty percent of the enzymes, okay, or protein. The other thirty percent um, protein might not be able to actually um, degrade the uh, or, or digest the protein. So you have a different protein or that can actually function to digest the other 20%. Okay. Even protein itself has um, multiple families. Uh, we are not going to go in very deep on that. Okay. So enzymes are also a polypeptide or polyamide in nature and forms a distinct three-dimensional structure. So if you look at the figure over here, okay, um, the small dot is water molecule. So this is what we call as the ribbon representation of an enzyme. So um, either it forms, oops, sorry, and these are the secondary structures. Okay? Of course, you guys have already known because you guys went through all my lectures for the second year. So please remember. Okay? So this one is um, five random coil, and um, and over there. Small section over there is the beta sheet. Okay, so um, ribbon representation. This one is the space filling representation. Okay, um, simple basic three dimensional structure. So, um, why does it form a three dimensional structure? Um, just recall, gives free energy. Okay, delta G equals to delta H minus T delta N. So, it has something to do with uh, free energy. Um, because the other day you have 20 different types of amino acids and then each amino acid can be characterized or can be grouped into either a polar, non-polar, um, charge residues and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, the outside of the enzymes are normally either polar, either polar neutral or polar, um, polar charge. Okay. While the internal are normally um, hydrophilic or uncharged. Okay, these ones. So you have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary foldings. Um, why do you need that? Or what are the factors that influences whether you have a primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary? Of course, it has been covered previously, so I'm not going to go in very detail. So, um, and um, these forces. Uh, actually stabilizes the whole structure. Okay, so you have hydrogen bonds, for example, if you recall, within um, a species, you do have a hydrogen bond between the uh, I plus uh, I plus three, okay, between number one and number four um, residues. Um, of course, again, I'm just talking about alpha helices. If you're talking about triple helix, if you're talking about uh, three tan helix, they have totally different stabilizing forces. Okay. That they are still hydrogen bonds, but um, the I plus uh, I plus three is just for uh, alpha helix. Hydrogen uh, connecting hydrogen for alpha helix. Okay. Um, salt bridge, of course, if you have uh, a polar charge refuse, you have salt bridge. You have just a bond between cysteine and amino acids, cysteine and cysteine. So that's so far, it's like that. It's an S. We have either the special force and pi pi interaction that comes from hydrophilic residues. Okay, so basic. Um, again, you need to know this because normally when I do my exams or, uh, or quizzes, I expect 
that the basic information from the second year is being carried out, uh, being carried over to your third year. Okay. I'm not going to do anything separately um, because otherwise it will just be a little bit uh, repetition. Um, so we'll just go into very uh, bit uh, detail, All right? And when you're talking about structure of enzymes, you have two general structure. One is globular, and second one is non-globular. Globular means it's like a wall, a glue. Okay? So it forms uh, almost a spherical structure. Non-globular is you know, non-globular. It's, it's not circular. So it can be very small, like that, um, or some other shapes. Okay? And of course, we have structural water um, surrounding the enzymes, okay? as I mentioned on over this side. Whether you guys can see the small red dots. Yeah, you can. Okay, so the small red dots are all structural water. You can see the structural water are uh, everywhere around the um, structure of the protein. And normally you will see the plus sign on the either the red or the blue color. So blue color is nitrogen, red color is oxygen. Okay, because so oxygen and nitrogen is where you can form hydrogen bonding. Okay, um, flexibility is the key feature. Now we, we're going to look at a little bit, or oh, probably next week, uh, we will start looking at um, how enzymes and flexibility comes into play. So when you're talking about, normally when you're talking about something globular, you might think about, you know, it's very rigid, um, it doesn't move, but uh, enzymes do move, and uh, flexibility of an enzyme is one of the key feature. what makes it a very, very either specific, or um, not specific to it, again. Okay, so we will just stop here, um, and we will continue next week. Um, have a good day ahead, and thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. See you next week. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Okay, then this looks...